Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Enter the Labyrinth podcast. I'm Banable Harka, here with Xenulus, Logan Taylor, Luke Wonderland, and no, I'm not, Kendall Burdett. And yeah, I think that now we've had, what, two weeks of set championships, and I'm curious how those have gone for everyone here. Uh, uh, I, I've only been able to go to one, uh, but I did end up winning the one I was able to go to, so feels good. <laughs> you can just retire there, 100%. Yeah, dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> so far, I've been to... I don't know. <laughs> I, believe, it, at his, I believe it's seven, his, I mean, but they, I'm not it, sure. <laughs> has it been seven? It's been two weeks, right? Mm-hmm. It's only been two oh, weeks. And I, it's five. It's been five. Oh, it's five. Five. Okay. Yeah, four days. I've been to five because I got to play in two in one day. Um, I've won two of them. I've top eighted four. So I lost in top eight twice. Uh, and then one I did not top eight. And the one I did in top eight is kind of hand wavy. Uh, I made a tweet about it. Um, my brother, who's like new to Lorcana, I've been. You know, he's been going to like these tournaments and stuff, and he hasn't top eight at a tournament yet. And um, so we got paired in like the fourth round when we were both two and one. And so we had the option to, I said we should play first because it guarantees one of us is in the top eight. Um, and yeah. I ended up basically having lethal in play, like in game two, to 2-0 him. Uh, but then I just decided to offer the draw and give us both a chance in the next round. Uh, and then we both, up. yeah. And then in round five, we both lost to green steel. So Oops. it killed us both. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he he has been playing that. He, he normally played red blue is what he's been playing. But for that tournament, he made a switch to that red green evasive deck that's kind of been popping up and it looked pretty fun it was actually pretty good i actually thought when we were going to play that like he or sorry we went, we went to three games actually but i thought when we were going to play that i think it has a really good chance against red purple and uh he was just going to beat me anyways and i much rather him just beat me than just like conceding or drawing with him so um yeah that was kind of that tournament, but regardless, I still didn't top eight. Um, but yeah, that red green deck I would say is pretty kind. It's pretty cool. I I have it with me. I'm gonna take it with me to Dallas to like maybe play some side events and stuff, or just play randomly. I took it to locals last night, and I think I went three and one with it. I beat two green steels. I beat a, a red purple, and then I lost to a red purple. So it's like fairly decent, I think. Yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's so it, weird. It just it looks it looks so unorthodox. Like the first <laughs> time I saw it, I was like, "There's no way this works, right?" Uh, Diablo is just a really good card, so you can just put Diablo in anything. But <laughs> yeah, not not I would say not as great a performance so far for me in these set champs compared to last time. But I really wasn't planning on going that much of a heater like last time. Um, I have. Because we're going to Dallas this weekend, I have just next weekend. I'm going to try to go to one on Saturday and Sunday. So I have two more. See how I do. Um, but yeah. Uh, even though I haven't done great, as great, uh, it, the days I was losing, I had a lot of tweets for people and like messages as far as um, people that have been messaging me thanking me for either coaching or they just bought the guide that i had written um so i've been keeping a track of that and i kind of want to do something at the end of set champs because right now i think it's close to 50 people so that's i'm crazy. sort of responsible for like 50 ursulas i don't know it's kind of <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah that's something like uh I've, I've only had two uh two coaching sessions but like both of my students reached out and they were like look at what i've won one won in ursula and one got top two at uh the set champs that he attended so like feels really good that uh i don't know it feels validating like maybe i know what i'm talking about <laughs> when yeah. it comes to the game 
<laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. It turns yeah. out getting coaching from the team uh, basically guarantees you Ursula's, so go uh, <laughs> go sign up for coaching. <laughs> I have a 100% success rate right now, so yeah, I'm just saying. In the fine print, obviously, you're Ursula, not guaranteed, but, um, you know. <laughs> Wait, no, three, because Cruz also got a uh, got a, a coaching session for me. Granted, he also got coaching from Kindle, like, the day before, so. So he, yeah, got, he doubled up. So he, he won in spite of your coaching, Logan, is what you're saying. <laughs> in spite of my coaching. <laughs> he went to Kindle first and then went to me and was like, I don't know, man, maybe Kindle was telling me some off-the-wall stuff about red-purple. <laughs> How'd wonder? How'd you do? Oh, you know, I lost one game or one match over three events. Um, <laughs> sadly, it was a top eight match, so I only won two Ursulas. Technically, I got first twice, but realistically, I split with Sky in the finals of one of them, like because we wanted to go get food, so we didn't even play. And I was like, I I had traded my other champion mat for second place mat because that person wanted it and he offered me some money to trade. So I was like, done. And then so Sky, I was like, well, I already have this one. Can I get the champ thing? He was like, sure, whatever. But it's going down as 2-1 in a joking manner, you know, or whatever. But like, so we didn't even play. Um, Get to fully play. So I don't know. I had the easy route. I got lucky enough to win my first three games. And then double draw in twice. Uh, it's like the dream. Uh, anyone who's played PTQs knows that's it's what you want to do. Yeah. Um, but then, like, they were smallish. Uh, a funny thing that happened is so the first one we went to, I normally don't like traveling very far, but it was the only one in the whole area. And I already knew people who were driving. And we went three and a half hours. And I. <sighs> If the Ursula was not worth so much, I definitely would not have driven three and a half hours for the <laughs> event. It was 12 people, and the lady I played against said that she was from Texas. Um, this was in the middle of Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> but she was up there, and her and her son was there for, for a family gathering. And then the funny thing is, is like two, a few days later, Cruz was mentioning in a group chat that some dude down in Florida was talking about his wife was visiting family in Nebraska and lost to some wizard person. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that was me. Like, I don't know how he was in Florida because they live in Texas. So it was like they both traveled somewhere else to it. And then there was also someone who traveled from uh, Colorado to play in it too. So there was four or five locals and then the rest were all out of town in the 12 person event. And that was only, yeah, it was 12 because it was four rounds. I don't know. It was small events, and I got lucky. All right. I'm... All you need, right? That's I heard of, I have a friend in Seattle. Uh, he said that they had somebody fly from Alaska into wow. Seattle Jeez. to play in a set champs. That's like, crazy. That's, that's I mean... dedication. I mean, that's great. Like, um, but, Do they not yeah, have any riders. locals up there? You think I mean, you really want to play in one? And like, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how many game stores are in Alaska. I guess if you're, you're really listening to this and you're in Alaska too. and you play Morkana, comment below. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> I'm curious. That I don't know. That seems about your games, your your events, like your set champs. Like, how many people was in yours? I'd be kind of interested to see what the average was. I felt like mine were kind of small. Uh, you were saying earlier, Kendall, that yours were like what twenty to thirty or something. Yeah, mine have all of mine have been like twenty five to no more than thirty two. And I have not been in a six round one yet. Um, probably the one next weekend, the store that it's at, and because it'll be like the last weekend, will probably be over the thirty two. I would guess. Um, yeah, I haven't played in a six round one yet. They've all just been five rounds, but right at like the top of the that cutoff. Mine was also right at 29, 30 people. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that is the standard. Maybe that's uh, where game stores are like really hoping. That's still a solid amount of people for a set champs, though. I think so. I think I, I played two. The first one, I think, had 27 or to 29, and then the second one had 25. Um, 
So I think, you know, around here, a lot of stores will cap theirs at 32 because that's about what they would get if they didn't cap it, but then they don't run the risk of accidentally getting 33 and having to play the extra round. Um, yeah, wow. I would be so upset if I showed up and it was capped just because they didn't want to play one more round. Well, I mean, they're all capped in melee. They all have you register on melee. They have the cap in melee. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's not really, it's not a situation where you're going to show up and not know, like you should have known ahead of time that you didn't have a slot. But yeah, um, as far as mine... I played Purple Steel both times. I thought I was going to switch decks, but I, after the first one, I really, really wanted to do well with Purple Steel one time because I was having fun with it. So the first time around, um, it's funny that you mentioned, Kendall, that your brother played because it was my brother's first tournament uh, ever. He only played like 10 games of Lorcana. We just like jammed a few games to try and teach him the rules. And then um, he came out and he went 2-3, which I, I was pretty proud of that. You know, I feel like that's pretty good for having basically never played the game before. And then... I went 3-2, obviously missing top 8 then. And then um, this last weekend on Sunday, I played another one, which I think kind of similar to yours, Wonderland. Like, I technically took it down, but um, basically uh, me and local Magic Limited Legend Scott Markison um, chopped in the finals. So, yeah, I got a playmat, got an Ursula, so I don't have to be embarrassed. That's always my concern. It's like... <laughs> If I if I can only play three of these and I don't win at least one Ursula or, or you know whatever the promo is, then it's like oh god, I look bad. <laughs> oh, dude, that's how oh, I pressure. felt like during the first ones when the stitchers were there. I was like, yo, if I don't bring home a stitch, I'm gonna be like a fraud. Yeah, I can't, can't be doing this. Uh, I was just gonna say the talking about the, like the brother thing. He he also because that was on Saturday when I kind of like we we drew both trying to still play the last round for top eight sunday he plays red green again second time he's played it in the tournament and he went three one and i thought he was going to get to draw in the last round but it, the the way that just all the breakers and all the x ones and stuff there were down. uh no he didn't get paired down but all a lot of the x ones had to play so Ooh. there was one table of x ones that drew and from that table one of those people got ninth place when they drew, like they drew themselves in the ninth place, mm. but they were willing to take that risk. And then all the other X ones had to play. Um, and so, yeah, he, like I thought after he was three and one, like, oh yeah, you should be able to probably draw on top eight. And like, I was already drawing in a top eight. So it was going to be like kind of cool. We'd both be in top eight and uh, he had to play and he lost to uh, blue steel, which probably is not a good matchup for that deck. Any kind of steel matchups. So. I would guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh. My subpar performance because I wanted my brother to actually make a top eight. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the one thing to note too, for any new player, but really just any player in general, even like good players, is like there's nothing. Nothing is guaranteed. You you can't you can't know ahead of time what your matchups are going to be. You can't guarantee that you won't get a bad hand here or there and 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 drop games for no fault of your own. Like it's not it's not free. You know, people lose all the time. I know sometimes I get paired against people in paper, and they're like, oh, no. I'm like, seriously, I lose all the time. It's not that big <laughs> yeah, a deal. Yeah, <laughs> you'll, exactly. you'll be all right. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. like, just touching on that, I mean, just look at R&B and Humble. Like, they, their locals around them are, like, stacked. Um, but even with them being stacked, like, I don't think Humble has won an Ursula yet. Uh, he keeps so, I mean, in like, top eight, right? I think. Yeah, like he keeps making yeah. top eight, but like still hasn't made it. There's so I mean, you know, even good players, even good players get beat. Um, it happens For sometimes. Sure. You draw bad ends. RMB didn't win a stitch, I don't think, and then won a Mickey instead. You know, so like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Don't beat yourself up if you don't get your promo. Like, it's probably good feedback too. I'm sure. I'm sure that'll be feedback again because it was the last time in set champs that some sort of compensation for top eight. Seriously, I don't know. I like the stores can give it. the The ones I lost in top eight, I didn't get anything. I was just like, okay. Which I, I think we talked about that before going into set champs. Yeah, the top eight not getting anything, and it shouldn't maybe it shouldn't necessarily be on the stores. Like if if Ravensburger wants them to be like a cut to top eight, I don't know. Maybe a oh, non foil like, version. You know, maybe yeah. top eight is the promos and like top four get a play mat, you know, or whatever, vice versa. I'm not sure. Like all the top eight gets a play mat and then top four are the promos, something. But 
yeah i I'm, i imagine if i went to the lorcana discord again uh that would be some sort of feedback that i would expect to see uh because yeah, i think people, people want to get something for top eating yeah non-foil would be cool i got four Just... boosters and uh mm -hmm. while that's <laughs> awesome for like a cheap local 2018 person event uh it still doesn't really lessen the blow of not getting an ursula <laughs> like there's like a bit a bit of a difference in prize whereas in like the the other lgs i played at they offered a top eight prize split um but they allow a silent like choice so they give you two cards one represents yes one is no half the people voted not to prize split the top eight uh i i always vote to prize split because I I know that if I say no, I will have the worst hands imaginable because that's just uh, <laughs> yeah. Like so, I always do it. I'm down I for not down. splitting. I just don't want to be the person to say no. <laughs> yeah, I sat down against my opponent, who was the person I had to beat in round three to double draw in, and he goes, "Yeah." As soon as I saw I was playing you, I was like, "Yeah, let's price split. Let's go ahead and price split." I was like, "Yeah, that I, that's smart." <laughs> like you know, like do in Swiss, like makes sense. He was playing, uh, like the Steel Fossa deck, and it was pretty cool. Like the the big Simbas and stuff, and it's like I wish it was a little better. But I mean, he made top eight. He got some product, uh, so maybe it is. It wasn't great against what I was playing, but he he was wrecking red purple, I think, which was kind of crazy. The top eight at my store was kind of varied too. Uh, we had Emerald Amethyst, Purple Steel. I think two, two red blues, two green steels, two red purples. Yeah, I don't know. I think locally here, people play like a lot of the main decks are pretty well represented. So you just never know what you're going to run into. Kind of just depends who shows up to what store at what time. And I don't know, like around here, there's often like for set champs, there's often like two stores running an event every day. So you kind of have to pick which one you go to. And I don't know. I I'm not. I'm not, you know, in the community enough to know like who's going where and when, you know, so it, it's hard to plan. But um, I've seen basically a lot of everything at this point. A little less Ruby Amethyst than I thought I would see, but um, you know, still. I don't know, dude. I've been following uh, all of the all of the Kindle shoutouts. <laughs> There've been a lot of Ruby Amethyst decks. Yeah, I was talking locally. Champs. Obviously, you know, there's <laughs> lots of them out there. There's no doubt about that. On on Villain's video that he just came out today, and by the time people watched this a few days ago, his section on red blue was bigger than the rest. And I don't know if that was because like there was that much variation. And most mm. of the people who won with red purple was just like, I played Kendall's list. So he's not just gonna be like, here's like the same list over and over and over and over. <laughs> um, so that that could also be one reason why it was that big. And like he showed a couple different lists for a while because they were just full of so many weird cards. Um, it does seem like uh Red Blue's now playing like a one of Hercules. Uh, which is kind of interesting as it does just one shot a castle, which is kind of neat. Um, and so he talked a little bit and about whether or not you run three Maui, two whatever, you know. And, and I think it was Moyen's list was four Maui and, and one, but also running a scar as well. And it's just like, whew. Yeah, I know that feel. Is, like, uh... I hate losing to castles. Yeah, red blues and shambles. I think, like, yeah, the red purple <laughs> lists are posting. They're like, two or three cards different and like red blue is just it was in a good yeah, spot in the meta and now it's just slowly like falling out there's just way too much red purple that just crept in <laughs> i was like oh all you guys having fun like i want to have fun too <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah yeah they're so trying like... a bunch of different things like pegasus and hercules and stuff i i played against red blue at such champs and they had pegasus and hercules like i played flynn rider they played pegasus and they're like no you're not and i was like Sure. So then, <laughs> so then I played a Sisu, and I just start questing with Sisu, and I'm like, all right, you know. Um, I was still able to beat all their like Ruby Amethyst tech cards, you know, because Ruby so, Amethyst can kind of do that. So Red Blue's like they're set to beat up on 
like amber steel and green steel. There's like almost no amber steel. And, and then blue steel, steel, kind of, right? A little bit, yeah. Well, uh, I'll get to that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but like green steel, it's not even an auto win, right? Like it's a good matchup. Um, it, it's a good joke, but <laughs> please stop. Like, like <laughs> they're, just, they're, just, they're gonna draw really well. They're gonna bucky a few times, you know, like. Yeah. It's you. You want to be two owing that matchup because that's your best matchup. That's one of the pillars. Like that's your good pillar matchup. Um, and it, it's only forty percent. I mean, yeah, people are playing red purple because it's forty percent across the board. But if you're getting bodied by red purple, and that's another pillar, like it, you're lo losing to red purple more often than you're beating green steel, puts me makes me not want to play a deck. Because it's just like I feel like that's the deck that's getting eaten in the rock paper scissors, and and like we're we're seeing that happen, right? Like people are playing more red purple because it beats red blue, and then so red blue shrinks, green steel gets a little stronger to try to fight red purple. But unlike red blue green steel, the red purple green steel matchup is slowly getting closer to fifty fifty. I, I don't think it's there yet. Uh, maybe Kendall does because he's a master, but like. It, it's probably close to the 40 45 percent range and that's not that bad for red purple to be in like that's why that you play the deck it's like close to 50 50 you hope they don't have a god draw and you hope to have your one or two answers and skill diff or get lucky through the rest of the game uh shout out to artibax i played a stream game of green steel versus him on red purple and he played all four be prepared two of which I think were in a row maybe, but he played all four. And then after the Be Prepared, he played Medusa off of top, bounce off top, bounce off top, bounce off top, bounce off top to kill my lethal... He was at 18... I was at 18 lore, no cards in hand, and I drew a lethal threat like five turns in a row, and he killed them with Medusas while bouncing them and then going <laughs> from zero lore to lethal, and it was absurd. And, like, that just happens sometimes, you know? I think um, if people want to watch it, that might be on his YouTube channel now. He put, I yeah. think something up. I, so. I'm pretty sure he uploaded it. Yeah, that's funny. It was a, it was a great it was a great set. You should check it out. I, I think I had triple Bucky in that game. But like as I've said multiple times, be prepared can undo all the work a Bucky does. It can't do that to a Flavorsham. Luckily, Castles beat the crap out of those Flavorshams. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think the green steel matchup, I wouldn't say it's gotten better, just developed a better game plan, and still unfavored, you're just not going to beat the high roll hands. And the green high roll steel. hands are what feel really bad, So, and that's why Bucky's getting you know, errated. So. I think green steel has evolved uh, to make itself worse against red-purple. Um, I think the more that players uh, devolve into mirror breaking, which I'm, you're very aware of, I mean, you you love spell books, right? Like, when you make your deck to beat the mirror, yeah. like you're you're sacrificing your other matchups. And so, like, the more Tinker Bells and Swords they're playing, the more games they're going to lose to Red Purple. Yeah, we have to. In the uh, the twenty Lord Jun thread, it's like someone was like, mentioned, "Hey, now that Red Purple is becoming more popular in the mirror, has anyone thought about adding Spellbook into their deck?" And like people just start spamming like the FBI gifts and stuff, like just kicking in the door and stuff. It's just, <laughs> it's like, please, like we have a good thing going here. Don't start like inbreeding yourself to try to beat the mirror match, <laughs> but, like adding a bunch of Spellbooks into your deck. <laughs> but if you want to, here's here's my super sweet tech for you. Don't add Spellbook because that's uninkable and stupid. Just put like uh, two Pascals in your deck and then murder the mirror that way. Yeah, yeah, Pascals. <laughs> what about? I, I would agree with Pascal before a spellbook for sure. I was gonna say Surfer Mini, but that's more devastating against the Brawl, so it's probably better just to play the Pascal. I think Pascal is having played Purple Steel. I put three Pascals in my list. It is. I don't know if I've ever lost a game where I played it on turn one against Ruby Amethyst because there's just nothing they can do. <laughs> I mean, so some of the decks that are playing, like the the Peter Pan, obviously have a good answer. But I've had Pascal Medusa a handful of times. I've had it Brawl a handful of times, and it just feels so good. I mean, yeah, if your Pascal's getting Medusa, you're probably in a good spot. <laughs> what, what are you supposed to do? Like, it's going to kill you. You have to do something. Yeah. The sweet, sweet 19-turn clock. Yeah, and the other times, the other times they have, like, 
they have to be prepared it and i still feel good there too because in those amethyst mirrors you don't really want to be playing be prepared either so yeah i think pascal probably a mirror breaker if you're looking for something inkable um and yeah always has been yeah. but what do you cut for the two pascal well that that's a separate question yeah or do you just run 62 just just be that guy no, I don't. Uh, think... so the first thing I was going to say is, well, the answer is not 62 cards. I'll tell you that. Much. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you'd cut. You'd have to, you have to go think about it. But um, th that would be a meta game call. Like at that point, you're saying, I think I'm going to play a lot of red purples, so I'm going to play something specifically for that matchup. And hopefully, you don't have to play other things where you wish you had the cards you cut. You know. I mean, you can always grab it and kill a Diablo. It's true. Then you have to play Crab and Pascal. Not a, it's a lot of stuff to make room for here. Are you? Did you play any Crabs, Kendall? I I can't remember if you went up to Crabs. Are you still on zero? Yeah, my my the list I'm currently playing has two Crabs. It's been like that for since the 10k basically. Okay. After the 10k is when I didn't play them in in the 10k, but after that I was like, okay, well, I wanted something if I was gonna keep playing like mirror matches essentially um the tremaines out of the like you know the stock list were probably the at best against the mirror anyways but definitely the mirror a lot comes down to queen's castle so crab gave you like two additional lines to answer castles supposed to be prepared um so yeah right now i'm playing two crabs all right well i guess if the crabs are already in there I just don't know how much room you have for flexi stuff like that. Like if you're gonna play crabs, I, I think those are maybe in the slots you would probably put Pascal in. So it's it's tricky to find room that way. But yeah, it's I mean, you able to answer Robin Hood a little bit sooner than Green Steel might expect as well. True. Since like everyone's been off of it for a little bit. I remember streaming Green Steel like a week ago, or streaming something and being like, "Oh, they might have grab," and someone's like, "No, no one plays that anymore." <laughs> it's like what? Like no one plays why crab. Not? All right. Well, what do people think the best deck is? I mean, obviously Ruby Amethyst has been on the come up for sure. Do we think Ruby Amethyst is the best deck? Is it still just Green Steel? Well, I mean, what's your definition of best deck? Well, I mean, like, like what? What's you know, Public Enemy number one as far as what? Well, Okay, so let, let's pick something more specific. Uh, Dallas is in a few days. What do we think is going to be the most played deck in Dallas? Red purple. Think so. I for sure think steel. it's. I think it's going to be red purple followed by green steel. I think those are going to be the top two for sure. And they could interchange, but I wouldn't I think be. They'll surprised. be really close. Yeah. Okay. It'll be close. I think I don't remember the stats from Germany, but green steel was pretty far ahead. Of it red was. Purple. It, it was, was, was kind of close. Like, red purple was ahead, like, but green steel converted way better, I think. Can green steel converted yeah. more. Oh. There were yeah, more green steels in top 64 just, than there were red purples, yeah. I really just think red purple is just always going to probably be the most represented deck, just for the fact that it's the most competitive deck you can probably play at, at cheapest. Yeah. You know? It's really competitive it's not like you're even sacrificing anything like it is you know like in my well in my opinion you know it's a tier one deck it's the cheapest deck and it's tier one it's like okay <laughs> you know <laughs> it's now if sure you're gonna say one. bucky if bucky is tier zero and that's eight hundred dollars you know for some people that's a no-brainer that they're just gonna play a tier one deck for a quarter of the cost so um, i beat a lot of red purple over my set champions like i think i played it like five or six times um but uh, it was my only loss in the first round of top eight. And it was against someone who had just recently started playing. Um, I crushed in game one and games two and three went long and some unfortunate things happened. But anyways, like he was playing red purple because it was the cheapest deck that was competitive. And he was just he came from Pokemon and he was like, it's like Gardevoir. I'm just drawing all the cards and all the time. And I'm just like, all right. I mean, like. It kind of is like it's interesting that it's referred to as Jund because like Jund didn't really draw cards. Like, it's a different game. I mean, sure, card draw is yeah. way more common in Lorcana than it ever was in Magic. I feel as far as like standard. It's like referenced like to me. Like, it's like Jund because it's the deck that's cheap. Has a good Jund is not spread. cheap. What that I <laughs> well, 
depending on when you play Junt. You can get a set of turbo boosts for yeah, cheap now. <laughs> yeah, I guess having the ever when the Tarmogoyfs were like $100, $200 a piece, it was probably super expensive outside of Tarmogoyfs. But realistically, there was a period of modern where you had to own a Tarmogoyf to even play modern. So like it was just part to, a part of the cost to play the game, which is kind of we're seeing that almost in Larkana. Uh, it's a weird segue I'm doing here, I guess. But uh, like what cards do you think like Diablo, Sad Beast? Like Fishbone Quill, Tomatoa. Like we're getting, we're finally seeing some cards, see like staples over multiple decks that are now like going up in price. Like Fishbone's almost ten dollars, I think now. Yeah, uh, I know, I know Ruby Amethyst the last set, and I don't really pay attention to the card prices that much. But I know, like in Dreamborn, like it gives you that price. I remember Red Purple would be just a little over a hundred dollars, and now it's a little over two hundred dollars, and it hasn't really added more expensive yeah. cards just a lot of the cards have gone up in price so like the de the deck is like value doubled and for what it used to cost um yeah like maui's stuff like maui's and be prepared from the first set are just yeah, like 15 dollars now you know so and you're not even running the legendary like in set one it was four legend four legendary dragons four ish ursula's like, and some or and then like two or three Elsas, yeah. And Those, Alad well, Aladdin's not legendary. At the end, they were playing more than two or three Elsas. I feel like it's like three or four Elsas at the end, because mm -hmm. it, it got to the point crazy. where the mirror, it's like all that mattered was Elsas and Aladdin's, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's yeah. Some some cards have definitely gone up. Um, I don't know. I like it's difficult to say. There's no cards you need because in Lorcana you're sort of limited to two ink colors, so. You know, you always have some choice about what deck you play. And it's like, if you don't want to play... If you're okay not playing Steel, then you don't have to own all the expensive Steel cards or whatever. You just have to pick some non-Steel deck to play. And then hope it exists next format or some something uses the shell. I think for the... right now is hitting some good areas. Like, you have Green Steel and Blue Steel, mm -hmm. which you could argue are, like, some of the big pillars... Like, Red, Blue, and Blue Steel kind of fill the same role. Um, we talked earlier, I think, about Red, Blue versus Blue Steel. I think that's really up to the players. Like, people who play Blue Steel say they beat Red, Blue. People who play Red, Blue say they blue beat Blue Steel. Uh, you played a little of both. Derek, what did you think? I, I, I still think Red, Blue beats Blue Steel. I think it's close. Like, you're playing very similar decks. You're both playing, you know, Ramp, Tomatoa. You've got Board Wipes, Removal whatever i you know blue steel comes out of the gate a little faster with things like smee depending on your build um you know tomatoes are a little better in blue steel but they're way easier to answer in red blue i think red blue is definitely a little bit ahead i think it's close um if these red blue decks are like getting really lo lost in the weeds trying to beat red purple i think that that maybe is some trouble like i think blue steel has done some of that as well with with like argies and whatever but i that being inkable makes it less of a problem in my opinion in in the matchup like if you're jamming hercules in your deck i i don't know that could that sort of stuff's a liability against blue steel i suspect because it just doesn't it doesn't matter that much it's like a bad removal piece but still yeah um i think it's close but i i have to imagine it, it favors red blue i think like it, the longer the game goes obviously like red blue's favorite just because red blue's removal is just better yep. in that matchup i mean when you can play one card to kill a tomatoa consistently over a lot of turns whereas like blue steel has like maybe three answers three hard answers to a tomatoa if they're running like let it go and hades yeah it's in any number of combinations three. yeah whereas like red blue has like what a lot six six minimum. yeah i mean be prepared dragons whatever so and obviously, if, if they know what they're doing, they'll be holding a dragon. Like, once you get to, to Tomatoa Inc., I feel like that's kind of standard practice when you're playing the red, blue versus blue steel. Make sure you have a dragon for the Tomatoa, otherwise, you know, lose, I guess. That's, <laughs> that's sort of the risk. Um, one thing I'm curious about blue steel is I haven't had a chance to play blue steel since some of this anti red purple tech has started coming out. Kendall, how do you feel against blue steel? Like, have you played against these, like, the 4-1 the builds at all? Uh, I did this past weekend. Yeah, 
So a lot of people in the last few weeks that I have coached are messaging me about this and I don't know what to tell them. I mean, I, you know, I, I have to tell them something, you know, but it, it's a different era when we don't have pixel born or anything. And it's yep. like, they're messaging, uh, have you like, you know, blue steel has been wrecking me with Argus, you know? So you kind of just have to come up with a game plan in your head or whatever. And I did finally get to play against it. I think like three times this past weekend. I didn't lose to it. Okay. So I don't know if it's necessarily helping. Like, yes, they played an Argus on turn two that cut your Flynn Rider off, but they didn't play a one jump and whatever, you know. So I tell them, I'm like, all right, so you play a Sisu. Like, still just quest with your Sisu. They trade. Like, if, if they're just playing one for one, like, that's exactly the kind of game that Red Purple wants to play, you know. If you're adding these kind of, like, medium cards into your deck that do you think people are just like too afraid they're like oh i don't want my my sisu to yeah. trade this lower grade card and then yeah then that's that puts that's the pressure on the castles i mean yeah that's what i that's what i tell them i'm like you know you just have to like some people i feel like just a lot of people just don't quest when they're not or don't quest when they're supposed to yep and they don't want to trade their Sisu for this Argus. And I'm just like, just take your two lore and get the 4 one off the board. And then your castle's going to be less threatened, right? So they're like adding just, I think that's really it, right? It's just like more Argus and maybe some more Rise. Yeah, but... I was already playing Rise in Chicago. I know some people were, but a lot of the Chicago lists were pretty light or empty on Rise altogether. Yeah, it's still not like too many answers. And it's like, if they're having to play those cards, that, that I mean, you want them to answer you. Like, you don't, you can't just let them, if y'all are both just, you know, goldfishing each other, like, Blue Steel's going to win all the time. Yeah. Um. So you have to do something to make them answer you. Um. But yeah, like, I think it's perfectly fine if they want to play Argus, and i rather them play an Argus on two than one jump, 100%. So, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I pro based on what my hand looked like, I'd probably be more inclined to just quest with my Flynn Rider also. Like, alright, like, Flynn's not triggering. Get a lore so, and trade with it. Would you still be unhappy with that Argus if they were then on turn three still playing a Fishbone and singing a one jump off of the Argus? Or would you not care because you probably could just send a Maleficent or something into the Argus and then it's not a big deal? Well, then if they played, like, Fishbone into one jump, then they still don't have any character in play. So, what are you... Do you get to play... A castle by then i mean your turn three you'd play sisu and then they ramp you know and then they play like their five drops so you either like b king them or you play a castle you know and they still don't have an additional character in play that's gonna threaten castle basically any turn that delays them from playing a whole new world early is like it just buys you time so that you can try to empty out your hand too because obviously they can empty their hand really fast so, like, you're just trying to do the same thing, but we just don't have the ability to do that a lot of times because all, all of Red Purple's cards are just value cards. <laughs> like, they all just draw cards, so, you know, you're sitting there spinning your wheels, playing Maleficent and Rabbit, trying to get rid of some cards in your hand, and you can't, but... Yeah, I think for people who aren't confident enough to just quest with their Sisu into the Argus and, and lose it, I think the way you have to think about it is if, if you just, like, leave your Sisu unexerted and, and they have their Argus, they've already traded. Like, effectively, yeah. they've already killed your Sisu because you refused to quest with it. So now they've killed your Sisu and they're still threatening your castles. Like, at some point you just have to... You have to accept the loss. It's not like... The deck isn't playing teeth right now, so you're not going to be able to remove the Argus. Like, it's there. It's, it's going to be there until it trades with your Sisu, so... You may as well get it off the board and open it up for your castles or whatever. I think that's something a lot of people that might be trying to pick up red purple that maybe played it like set one through three are struggling with because red purple is not it is not the same deck that it was. It plays completely differently. The game plans are not the same as they used to be. Um, so it takes a lot of reworking um, as far as mindset when it comes down to mulligans and just game plan. Like now, it feels like you you kind of have to be in the 
in the driver's seat for a lot of matchups. And if you let off that's and let other people like get their game plans going, that's when you start to fall behind. For sure. I think that the Ruby Amethyst is deceptively difficult. Like it seems easier than it is in part because, you know, you're, it's mostly like a curve out deck. You, you just want to do one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever um, in most of your games, which makes it seem easier than it is. But the, the, the nature of the deck results in it having a lot of close lore races where every single lore you get ends up mattering because you're not blowing people out 20 to 2 with the deck. It just doesn't happen. So I think that you you need to be careful not to leave lore on the table. Um, I also think like Chernobyl's followers is hard for a lot of people. I think I've seen a lot of people struggle with when to leave it on board, when to not cantrip with it. I think one of the most egregious things people do is they'll just like turn it sideways and draw a card when your opponent has no board. It's like, just leave it in play. Do it. Draw next turn. <laughs> I, I, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, obviously, if you need ink, there are exceptions. It's just, I think that that can be deceptively difficult sometimes. Well, Blue Steel. So, Blue Steel is probably going to be the third most played deck. Is everyone agree with that? I think Red Blue's kind of fallen off for Dallas. I would guess Blue Steel is going to be the third most played deck. Any... I don't know, to be no. honest. It and red blue, it's gonna be close. Okay. Um I don't know, like I, I think it's possible. I think it's a really good pick for Texas if you're going to Texas. I, I think you're not gonna be in a bad spot bringing blue steel just because of how well it can do into green steel and red purple when piloted well. Um there are just a lot of different variations for blue steel i think of all the like things you can tech in i think arguably blue steel might be the most techable deck at the moment maybe somebody will disagree with me but i i think it has the most flex options to cover whatever matchup you're most scared of honestly i certainly i think it's very techable there's no doubt about that i feel like red blue doesn't have that much it can change red purple lists seem to be pretty set in stone green steel green steel has quite a bit of variation actually in like a six to eight card amount but that normally is like two to three different cards but like its main core is like normally the same yeah i would but say like blue steel like two lists versions. shift more cards than than most other decks like how many rise are you playing are you playing argus are you playing wheel no wheel one or two workshops maybe even aerial no aerial like there's quite a there's quite a bit of variation, I think, between very successful blue steel builds for sure. And I think that's what makes like going up against blue steel in general one of the more difficult matchups to kind of like immediately identify because you you just aren't sure like what tech cards they might be running or not running, or what do I need to look out for? What am I safe to just not have to play around? Because yeah. they could have it all. <laughs> and then if they have it all, then you're just kind of dead on arrival, honestly. <laughs> for sure. Also figuring out if they're playing a whole new world or not. Yeah, that's a tough yeah. one. And I think that I, I don't even know if there's like a dead giveaway. I think workshop is often like if you see Marie's Yeah, workshop, workshop's the giveaway that they're probably not. But some decks don't play any. Some don't even play that. Um, and really not a giveaway, I don't think. I think like how far I'll go is maybe the most clear giveaway. I think mm -hmm. again, not everyone's playing that either, but um if they are playing it, they're almost certainly not playing wheel. I think that's maybe the most obvious one but i would just say 95 percent of the time they're probably playing a whole new world you know? i agree but i don't think I the non-wheel version is as common as just playing a whole new world so but i i have for sure got got by a list that was not <laughs> running a whole new world and they were inking aggressively on like turn four like they had it so i started you know trying to dump my hand and lo and behold they just had a high room and like extra items and that, like they got me they got me really good so watch out for the no wheel list they will get you <laughs> yeah I, I recommend and this is advice i've given to people too is that you don't you don't want to prioritize card draw against blue steel because they often can wheel you and you don't want to spend like your resources getting more cards that you're just going to lose but you don't want to be empty on it i think like one of my favorite things to do with with like purple steel or, or red purple is to just have my last card be a rabbit or something like that or like my last two cards be like a rabbit and a bounce character so that i know i'm not gassed out but i can empty most of my hand 
knowing that, okay, well, if I lose my hands, no big deal. You know, I, I, I've used my resources as efficiently as I can to gain lore, but also if I don't lose my hand, then I'm not just like DOA because I have no more cards. I don't know how you feel about that, Kendall, but I definitely seen people yeah. get burned, just like dump their whole hand and they just don't get wheeled. Even if they have it, like you don't no. need to. Yeah, that's a tip I get all the time. Try to just keep the same amount of cards in your hand as them, for one. But two, like, yeah, don't dump your hand just expecting that they're going to whole new world you and be like, all right, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. And then they just don't do it. Because especially, like, they with Fishbone Quill, they have the option to always pivot off of that anyways. Yes. Um, you know, where, like, Amber Steel is kind of locked in on playing a whole new world. They have no way to get rid of it, and they want to do that anyways. Blue Steel can pivot. They can play Fishbone Quill. Or, or like fishbone quill the whole new world away and just like play like a Hiram game plan so mm -hmm. yeah it's important to have some stuff in your hand in case if they're not on a early whole new world uh just to kind of get you into like the mid game all right well um as far as dallas again you three are going to dallas i will not be there and i know so i think wonderland and and insane list are not a big fan of talking about what they're going to play. I'm, you know, I don't know if Kendall's locked in a list yet, but it's maybe <laughs> less of a surprise what he might play. <laughs> no, yeah, I tweeted today. So, like, people, a lot of people got my guide and stuff, and I tweeted. I added some more stuff to it today as far as, like, to help with inking decisions, and then I added two matchups in Hyper Aggro and Mufasa. But I also just said it, like, also includes the list I'll play, but the list is just, in fact, what I played the last two weeks now. Like, I'm pretty happy happy with it, not thinking I would really change anything. So, but it's there. Yeah, yeah it's I'm red purple. I, yeah, Kindle's on red purple. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm I'm waffling between three options right now. Um, like you know, there's I, I played Green Steel and Set Champs, and like it felt fine. Um, but I, I don't know. If that's what I want to sleep for Texas, um, I'm forever the most undecided. I feel of most of the team before big events. Um, so yeah, it'll for sure be one of my three options that I have picked out. I just don't know which one yet. Do you, do you know what the other two things you're thinking about are? Or are you just like completely? I, I so my other two options other than green steel are blue steel and red purple. Um, okay. I, I think, just kind of like we were talking about before, I, I think those are going to be the three strongest things you can take. Not to say that there won't be other things that we will see in day two. I'm sure there's going to be some uh, some fringe picks that make it into day two. I mean, just look at Chicago with the uh, Amber Emerald list that Humble and I went over in our uh, set champs video. Like, I think there's a strong possibility something like that will make it into day two. But... As for me, for the decks I have reps on, those are the three I have the most reps on. It's just <laughs> deciding last minute which one I'll feel the most confident in. Yeah, that's always tough. Best of luck to you. If I were playing, <laughs> I'd probably play Blue Steel. I'd, I don't know exactly what I would do. Now that all these red-purple matchups gotten more common and they're playing all of these um, edict, edict effects with... Uh, what's the card name? Uh, be king undisputed. Be king yes, undisputed. be king undisputed. I'd probably go back to like a Mickey build if I had to play that deck. Um, would I play Argus? I don't know that. I haven't had a chance to test that. Um, but I think I'd probably be doing some sort of Mickey thing just because getting blown up by all these be kings and like some people are also playing uh, Tremains as well. Just feels like where I'd want to be. Um, you know, it's got like some incidental value when you're on the draw against Green Steel as well, not getting hit by Ursula or whatever. But I'm not there. I won't be there, so I don't have to worry about it, which is nice. <laughs> hey, for what it's worth, RMB uh, fully endorses Argus and uh, does not endorse Mickey. So I know. It's <laughs> funny. It's funny because I spent three sets telling him he should play one jump ahead, and he's like, Mickey, 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 I feel. And then I <laughs> now I want to play Mickey, and he's like, not nah, one jump. I'm like, okay. Whatever. <laughs> Fine. Fine, though. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can see, I can see how playing Mickey though, like having Argus and Mickey to definitely insulate you against speaking undisputed, is probably a pretty good idea. Yeah, coming from the red purple side, I would say, if you're already gonna spend your two playing Argus, like you might as well just have your ramp on three, either yeah. be Fishbone or Mickey, 
and having the option to just have this like one three body in play that you don't care about as uh just like edict fodder you know it's pretty, pretty good yeah that's that's basically it and then not getting taken by ursula is the only other thing i i love i love one jump i think that you know i still think that turn three flavorsham is like one of the most powerful things you can do it's just first of all i think the best place to do that is like in the sapphire mirrors which i think are going to be less common than they were in chicago or you know two weeks ago even so i think that's just less important than not getting absolutely blown out by rabbit singing the king undisputed and <laughs> killing your five drop or whatever for free because that that that's game over um yeah but, uh, i wish you know, i could play lantern that's what i want to play really texas mm -hmm. i just want to go back and play amber steel lantern i want three drop aladdin not to exist <laughs> i want these blue steel players who are starting to play hard-headed beasts to just stop it um and then people to forget that the three drop location or item destroy exists <laughs> and like maybe maybe i can play lantern on turn two lantern turn three with an aerial turn four play uh tinkerbell sing swords and like i can just wreck green steel all day and lantern's always been a house against red purple especially if you have the whole new world and it's like oh you brawled my aerial well good thing i have double lantern i'll just play a robin hood brawl that like you're two or three turns away from a medusa i haven't really tried it because it's so bad against the other things in the format um and benjas but benjas like kind of on a low except for the the purple steel uh, how many did you play three or two i mean i have three i wouldn't worry too much about purple steel i think it'll be in dallas but it's going to be like you'll play it one five. time or yeah none. zero to one times yeah. basically yeah that it's i, mean, I, I would expect I'm, I'm most people will never play it but i'm bringing all of my green steel cards i i hope i won't use them there's a high chance i will be playing ursula uh in texas um they're just I think almost every Ursula printed in the game I've liked. Um, even this expensive seven drop, she's kind of good. Like even the, the the little two purple drop, like that's just a Prince Eric, right? It's like not that mm -hmm. bad. It's not great, but it's not that bad. That's a beautiful kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, come say come say hi in Dallas. Um, the the team will be there. We love to chat. Uh, love meeting fans, talking. Uh, I think we can we can leave Dallas there. We, we want to talk about some spoilers real quick. I know there's been some pretty cool cards revealed in the last couple weeks. Oh, just as a reminder, anybody that does come say hi in Dallas, um, we're going to have our Labyrinth poker chips and ink placement cards. So if somebody would like some of those, we'll have them on hand so you can come look at them and see how cool they are. Please do, please do. Oh, I might use them. I might use some too. I'm definitely using the poker chip. Um, I oh, don't for know sure. if I use the ink counters or not, mostly because uh, I haven't tried using them yet, so I don't necessarily know if I want to use have my first event trying something out be a challenge. That said, yeah, I'm gonna sign some and give them out. I bet for sure. <laughs> but right. on to spoilers. Yeah, spoilers. So. Uh, what do we want to talk about first? We we had a few cards picked out that that, that seemed fun for constructed play. I know. I think the first thing you mentioned. I'm going say let's talk about the big lion in the room. The the <laughs> the the true blue fossa. The true blue fossa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. Um, does anyone have it pulled up? Want to read the stats on it? Oh, I believe it's a eight uninkable five nine. Quest for four. And it says... I don't know. When, he, it's when you play him, you put two random cards from your inkwell back into your hand, and when he quests, you ready all of your ink. Exerted ink. Yeah, it's definitely... Um, I think it's an interesting card in part because I think when you look at the Sapphire decks with it, that have a bunch of ramp, the... The actual Sapphire finishers have been pretty lacking. This is a pretty strong 
actual finisher in Sapphire, which kind of opens you up to playing any color at this point. I know you've often relied on, you know, Tinkerbell's, like, Big Simba, um, Maleficent Dragon, that sort of stuff as your your top end. I guess Tamatoa and, and Dimer in Sapphire. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think just as, like, a generic, you can play it in any any ramp deck. It's, it's pretty sweet as a threat. Uninkable, a little bit awkward, but you're probably playing Fishbone in that sort of deck anyway. So, you know, there's some mitigation there. It's cool that it basically draws cards. I think he's good. I don't know if he's good enough to make the cut. It, I, I think it'll just come down to like how he performs compared to like Tamatoa or if he's actually yeah. consistent. Him having to actually resolve makes him a little bit worse. Yeah, I think so. Like that late in the game, how often is he actually going to get to turn sideways? Well, I guess the two like. The fact that he does have to quest, I don't know, like, for four, though, like, Tomatoa, you've activated dimes on Tomatoa for, like, two before, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you get to activate for eight or whatever, and that's insane, but the important thing is, is, one, he doesn't die to Medusa, and two, doesn't die to Maui. (laughs) (laughs) So he's got those two things going for him. Trouble is, though, if he does die, you're down two ink, which can be brutal. Yeah. Kind of draws you two cards, but sets you back two. But in blue, when you're ramping, is good. Now, I made the joke trying to play it in like blue yellow Mufasa. And if you flip this off of your yellow Mufasa, it's probably going to feel bad <laughs> going back <laughs> into true. it. But um, like, it dying isn't that bad. Like, you got, it costs eight. It's going to come into play. You go down to six. Like, you're still going to be able to cast the Be Prepared if you're in si- if you're in Ruby, right? Because you, like, you ink back up into 7 the next turn. So. Yeah. And yeah, he can like, sing it, it as well, fine. but I don't know if we're <laughs> playing it. Maybe we're back to singing B again. Preps again? Like, why not, right? Like, yeah. you basically kill everything and have 7 open after getting your free draw 2. Uh, I think the... I think its ability to return two of your inked cards to your hand is like big game, especially if you're playing with Maleficent Dragons um, and things like that. And then who knows, like maybe your dime got hit from a fishbone or a one jump ahead. Like it could be okay. But really, I'm excited about the one drop Basil because now we get to play Mold Drifter if we want to. I don't know if that's going to be good. I, but I love me some Mold Drifters. Right, Better so Mold Drifter. Which one is Mold that? that doesn't evoke. The new Basil is a one drop. He's like a two one support. Yeah, it's it's income. nothing to write home about. Oh, okay. it's a shift, target. shift one. It's a shift you'll target one for, this. for five to draw two cards, yeah. and then God. you can sing. God. And then so you shift, you draw two cards, and you play that new blue card, the one drop that you can put any character you control into your ink. So you draw two cards and then get two ink for three cards. I mean, yeah, this sounds fantastic. <laughs> Not magical Christmas land at all. Sounds like a wild setup for like not game winning (laughs) payoff. (laughs) It's value, but yeah. Yeah. I just want to point out for a second though, the Mufasa really cool art and the ability is really cool. Like no other card does that right now. But I just want to say mechanically and paper that that ability is probably like kind of annoying. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's going to be more annoying. I don't you're gonna think have it's to any sh- more annoying than Bruno. It's uh, worse because you're gonna have so much more ink. Like you have to use a D twenty. You have like, a lot more ink than you do cards in hand normally when you're getting Brunoed. I mean, you, of the just, time. you just shuffle it. You have them cut it. You spread it out, and you just have them pick two cards. Is that random? I don't know, man. Yes. I mean, I think that's as random as you could realistically get. You, you I think the way to do it <laughs> is gonna be make them roll dice on him to Turok. Yeah, yeah, that's not random. You shuffle your hand; your hand's random. How are they going to know? I always but roll the cards they're Bruno. picking are not at random. They kind of are. <laughs> I ask like your judge. opponent doesn't know what they are. <laughs> yeah. My judges have always said I was fine. Yeah, I don't uh, know what the rule is or, or what they do, but I feel like uh, that the like the up and up way to do it is probably to use a die. And unfortunately, if you have thirteen ink, like I agree. I, just, I don't. I don't personally care. I just know it's big controversy. You can a lot of people will disagree that that's not random if they just like pick two cards out of your inkwell. Yeah, I mean, I also Ooh. don't care, but it, it is like 
either way, it's a whole thing. Like you gotta pick up your inkway, you gotta shuffle it. Um, uh, so yeah, because I imagine pick, you would you just... still shuffle your inkwell up, right? Because yeah, so just shuffle your if inkwell. If they are gonna pick two it... cards and they paid attention, some you know savant has paid attention to like what you've inked, where <laughs> yeah. you've inked it. You know, still like shuffling your inkwell up in in blue when you have fifteen plus ink or sometimes you know because shuffling your deck's so hard. Like if 15, 15 cards is too much to shuffle, I, like you shuffle your deck to present it every time. No, it's I just think another thing. Shuffling your ink well and having no, them I cut didn't it. Say and it's hard. I just said mechanically, too. you know, oh. in a game where it's already kind of awkward distinguishing your hand from your ink well. And that's you very know, true. But also, eight know. of them are now exerted. So it's like you've got eight ink exerted. Now. Oh, yeah. And you have to keep track of what's exerted. Yeah. Whatsoever. It's just the whole thing. It's. Yep. I don't know. It works I, great I in the online for one I'll say that. Yeah, well, <laughs> keep wishing, buddy. <laughs> well, I know one card um, I'm super excited to play with is the uh, the new Daisy Duck, the the Goblin Guide of Lorcana. She's so good. Yes, she's yeah. so wildly good. So that one's what a, it's a one four uninkable quest for two. And then whenever you quest, the opponent reveals the top card of their deck and if it's a character they draw it is that correct yep. it's a character they draw it if not they put it on the bottom of their deck yep yep so yeah just a super aggressive card hard to remove and you know i guess the idea here is that you're trying to end the game fast enough before the number of cards your opponent has in their hand just doesn't it never comes into play because you get to 20 lore before they can ever use them and yeah classic goblin guide strategy i'm i'm not that impressed mostly because I misread it the first time, and I thought it triggered on you and your opponent, and I thought it drew me a card. So once I found out oh. it wasn't drawing me a card every turn, I was like, well, this isn't nearly good enough. Like, it could have been so much better, Derek. It could be so much better. <laughs> that would be ban on sight level good, I, I fear. <laughs> it's uneven. Ah, uh, yes, you, know? you, just, you just both flip the top card of your deck, and maybe you both draw a card, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, Mufasa gets some more toys. Sure, sure. Uh, to be fair, I think she's still a Mufasa toy. Like, you already... Gotta... I mean, you already, you know, as Humble likes to say, like, man, these colors have no good one-drops. So <laughs> he's finally getting a good one-drop that he, uh, he could consistently play and not feel bad about. She's yeah. got... She's thick. Her yeah. and Rapunzel... They're going out partying, and they're drawing three cards sometimes. And she can handle it. Like, she's she's good to go. Like, that's it's going to be good card advantage, and you're going to gain a lot of lore. I, I think just the fact that nothing kills it early on, you know, until basically Fox Fim is the first real threat for the card, I think, that it's crazy. I mean, it's going to easily get two, two quests in. Um, you know, three a lot of the time, pretty easily, and if people have to use two characters to challenge it down, like that's it's basically a bodyguard for your other small characters, right? Um, it's just, yeah, I think all around, it's going to be a high risk card. Like, if you're doing that and and your opponent is drawing a bunch of cards and then they answer it and you don't have a, a super fast start otherwise, like you're going to be buried in card advantage, it could be a problem. I think it's cool, like in a wheel deck though too, the fact that you just give your bunch of character your opponent a bunch of cards and then just wheel them away, it seems kind of sweet to me. Not sure if they're. It's it's also just a good evolution for aggressive characters. Yes. Um, we really need three and four toughness. Like currently, steel just like stops aggro in its spot. It, it's like too difficult for aggro to compete. Like their best plays get killed by opposing one drops, and not only do they get killed, your opponents like drawing cards off a of storm. Um, they're they're singing friends and then drawing off a Rapunzel if they need to, you know, or they're just playing brawl for a one for one on your three drop threat or your or your four drop threat, or like Medusa on your five and six. So they're they're like equalizing one for ones. Um, and this kind of like plays a little around that where like the only realistic removal, like all the removal I can think of, is basically a three drop, and like so. Amber Steel going turn one Cinderella, they still can't kill 
your turn one character. They actually, they they just, unless they create a zero drop, like, you, you can't rage it. And so you have no way to actually kill it. I can't think of another character that comes down on turn one that actually can't die to a rage. Like, a, a one drop zero four that people play. Like, I can't think of one. Um, and that's kind of big. Um, especially if they play multiple of them. Uh, swords used to be like this thing that was like, oh, you're pl like if aggro became a real deck, it's like whatever. I'm just gonna play four swords. Like, good game. Like, uh, just an easy answer. Tinkerbell was the answer. Uh, these like your six drop answer doesn't answer my one drop anymore. It's yeah. like uh, Chuck's had recent success playing uh, the flute or harp, harp in Amber Steel. And I think a big reason is because it has a four butt. And so he's not playing that one on turn one. He's multi cat multi playing cards on turn like four. He's singing removal and playing like three two lore threats and being like, get it, like answer this or die. And or, answer this or I win the game. And and he's kinda <laughs> going with that. And I th I think this is is a good evolution in that to make aggro decks not just die to steal, which for sure i agree yeah i i think i think it's sweet i don't know if it'll be good like it obviously depends on what kind of deck maybe coalesces around it um but i, I love it as an option that that's all i'll say i, mean, I, think I want better one drops option. isn't that a super rare yeah like i want as long a super it's not rare. legendary <laughs> no it's not it's not a, it's not a legendary i'm pretty sure it's a super rare I yeah it is a super rare super rare yeah, I mean, as red purple, you're probably gonna die to that card a lot. I just hope we have better one drops. <laughs> Honestly, I'm tired of playing with turn box followers, so <laughs> I want a nice body, Rafiki? nice statted body. Rafiki was kind of nice. Still not enough. But... I liked the one threes. The one threes have just been the most vanilla, best thing I could play because it guaranteed that you were gonna play like a snake on two. You know, yeah. like it just couldn't really die to anything. They could hold teeth damage too. That was the other thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm just tired of losing my one drops to like let the storm rage on and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it is brutal. Yeah. Ship Diablo, kill your one drop is, uh, and that's one of the reasons the red purple has been playing so few one drops. That and Cindy both just like. What are you supposed to do? <laughs> you drop a one. You drop a turn box followers on like, you know, turn turn eight after you B prep, and then they just play Tinkerbell. And it's like, ah, well, that was a fun idea. Yeah. Speaking of one drops, let's segue into Happy. Uh, basically, during your turn, it has evasive, and so far we saw that on Jafar, and we saw that on Deville, and. They saw some limited play, um, but being a one drop, I think, is huge. Uh, although it does, they can still sing removal onto it with their Diablo. But you have to be much happier to play a one drop than a Pegasus. Like, Pegasus is not, especially if they're on the play, because then, like, they get to draw one card at least, two cards by the time you're trading your Pegasus into it, if they don't have the removal for it. Where this one, you're jamming it on turn one, it's making that their Robin Hood can't quest on turn two without a cove. It's making it that their Diablo can't quest, you know, as well. I, I think that's a, a pretty good place to be for a one drop. Two one, quest for one. I think of all the dwarves revealed, I think he's by far the best dwarf, for sure. Oh. Disrespect and Doc, but we'll get to that here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not convinced it's going to see play, but I do think it's nice to have a one-drop option for that sort of evasive hate kind of um, slot. I know people have been playing Pegasus, Broom, Jafar, Cruella over the, you know, the last few sets, and you know, it's got some potential just because it is a one-drop and, and can fill a different spot on the curve than most of these options have been two-drops in the past, obviously. But okay, Doc. You want to talk about Doc? Well, so I played a little bit of Legends of Runeterra, the League of Legends card game, and they had a card that was pretty similar to this, but it cost six. It, I, I forgot that it did the third part. It also deals three damage, which is obviously 
nothing to shrug at, but it costs six. It's a three, three. <laughs> when it comes into play, you discard your hand, you draw three cards and you deal three damage to any target. Um, obviously super busted. This doesn't deal three damage and it draws one less card, but it only costs two. And I actually think that's really big for your aggressive deck. When you're at that, like four or five ink, you're out of cards. Red purple has just been grinding you, grinding you. You draw this two drop, it's a one three for two, it only quests for one. It's not that impressive. But you have no cards in hand, you just jam it on the board, you draw two fresh cards, like you can play two more threats right there. Like you could go from like no lore to having a diversified triple threat, or just like draw an ink and then play uh, a rabbit if like you're into that type of thing. Or who knows what your other color is. It, 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 in general, it's actually quite powerful. Um, someone did the math. I think Bjorn did the math. It was like you could play Chernabog on turn three or four with this. Uh, like it, it can do some crazy things, and I just think it's good value. And it's a May ability, so if you draw a bunch of them, you can like play one, then play the other, and then draw cards. Like it's it's more powerful than it looks, and it's another thing that I think is good for these aggressive decks to have, so they just don't pitter putter and lose instantly to the deck that. Kendall's playing when he's drawing five cards a turn and playing Brawls and Medusas, making you cry. Wow. <laughs> That's how we all feel about Red <laughs> Really? It's, it's no. how. Like, yeah, Doc's cool. He banned Bucky, someone, but. Someone on Twitter <laughs> talked about using Perdita with it, you know? It's kind of like cool That's recursion. Cool. You know? Because at that point, right, Perdita's 16, so you got 16 to work with. You're just playing a few cards a turn. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I I, I agree. a lot of value. I, I love that It'd be it's nice just to a, have a tool for aggro, and we haven't had a lot of we haven't had a lot of unique tools for aggro decks like this. Um, you know, between this and the Daisy Duck, I feel gives you some options that aggro decks used to be so boring before. You just like play high lore questers and maybe some evasive characters and just turn sideways. But this, I feel like you know, there's some thinking that can go into this. Um, it allows this for could also be a mid range card, like for sure instead of playing a whole new world that also refills your opponent, like, it could fill a similar, like, hard draw late game. Like, you empty your hand and you try to refill it with this. Like, if you have enough cards like this to do that, like, it it does create the... I mean, that's what Red Purple's doing, right? I mean, you have Maleficent, Friends, Rabbit, Castle. Uh, I'm sure there's other card draw things in that stupid deck. Yeah, and then 20 years from now, it'll enable some broken combo and whatever our version yes. of Legacy is. <laughs> and, yes. and yeah, Let's put some Vengevines in play and just, like, go to town. <laughs> how long? Awesome. How long until we have when this character can quest on the turn it comes into play? Hopefully you never. Think they'll ever do it? I Hopefully hope not. Hopefully never. Because you can't block. Uh, you don't like like that, that, I don't know. Please. There's a I couple. Mean, but you have go. You have go. There's a couple. You couldn't do it that much. Um, there's a couple things you could do. One of the things is like it's very low statted, right? You can make like a zero one. Yeah. And like when it quests, it deals the damage to itself or something like that. I think so. There's like... like that. But one thing that when the game first came out in set one, I had this conversation with my friend Luna on the way up to Tennessee. One thing that they could do is like make it sort of like a catch up mechanic where it can quest the turn it comes into play if your opponent has more lore than you. I could see that, maybe. But just coming, oh. just straight up, just playing it and, like, questing immediately, because, yeah, there are no blockers or anything like that. So you're telling me that Goat, if, if Goat just said, when this leaves play, you gain a life, or you gain a lore, but it could quest the turn it comes into play, that that's, like better i would argue that it's worse than goat because well, then they can challenge it I, like goats already gaining one and they they can't kill it i think like the thing with goat is like it's one card what what i don't want and hope they don't do is make it's like a, a keyword a like, i don't cards. like keyword yeah if they make yeah. if, if two sets for now they make another thing that's like somewhat like goat fine whatever that's not a big deal that's a card if suddenly like every you know three colors have like five characters that can just like quest it's so it's already hard to stop people from chipping in for the last like three, four lore. I feel like a lot of decks like they're 
you basically feel like you're dead once your opponent gets to 17 because there's just no way to kill every single thing they play till the end of the game. Whereas this like makes it even harder. So I I, I don't know. Yeah, that's why I said if it was something like a keyword, it, it could be like a catch up thing. Right? That I think Where is fair. Yeah. If they had more lore than you, they can quest. If there was more playable lore loss. Do you think it would be more reasonable? Yeah, if they leaned in heavier to like lore control, because the options we have right now aren't that great, then yeah, you could make it some like back and forth swingy thing. It'd be, I think that's probably really hard to balance, but it would, I think it'd make the game feel pretty cool if we had a lot more lore control, like loss of lore, but there was also ways to aggressively gain lore as well. Um, it'd be really cool, like sort of back and forth. I, I suspect some people would hate it. I think it would turn <laughs> oh, out sure. it would turn off so, some people pretty hard. It's kind of interesting because like going to 20 lore and dealing your opponent 20 damage, magic to to Lorcana. They are like they look the same and people it's like, "Oh, it's the same picture." Ha ha. But it's so much different. So much different. And people don't care if your opponent gains life. People get salty if you make them lose lore. And it's, a, it's, it's true. literally the same thing. What's the it, card? It's the exact same thing. What's the Bucky that does it? Um, The Floodborne uh, character? John? Yeah, it's like Honest, Honest John. John. Oh, man. Honest I've had John, that play yeah. against me like two times, and every time I'm just like seething. <laughs> I get to, I get to <laughs> 18. Like you never get mad when your opponent's like healing salve game three. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's a different thing. But yeah, I get to 18, and suddenly like, Bloodborne, Bloodborne, I'm like, oh my god, 16 so much farther away than 18 was. <laughs> it was kind of the same thing with, like, Lyle, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, like, Lorcana Bros played a lot of games against, like, where Lyle's come up, and he's like, this is so stupid. I was so close, and now I've, I'm not. I've seen Lyle, like, a pile of Lyle's take away just, like, double-digit lore with yeah. the E-Prep. It's crazy. Like, Aaron, I think, in one of his games, he got reset from, like, 14 lore down to like six yep yeah so i'm not sure they'll make that super common either just because of how it feels all right do we want to talk about uh one last card we want to talk about merlin's hut i know logan you you mentioned that you like the idea of merlin's hut um this is by far my favorite card <laughs> just because like i i think it's neat um uh, i don't know I, i've never I haven't played a lot of card games like you guys have. Like the only one I've played was the World of Warcraft TCG, and we never had something like this. So this effect is really cool. That we already have a couple of synergies with like Sorcerer's Hat and Bruno to possibly like make kind of a skeleton around an archetype around it. I don't know. the The idea is cool. I, I like the thought. In practice, maybe it won't pan out, but like I, I think the effects the effect is is uh something i'll have fun with at least like i'm for sure gonna try to make a blurple that blurple deck work with it just because it, it's another new effect we're getting and i i don't know i'm excited about it i think it's cool yeah those effects were always fun and magic other than playing against lantern control <laughs> yeah in a Where's vacuum that? that merlin's cottage cottage the card stinks but yes the effect is really cool and fun uh, and it just needs some enablers, like Sorcerer's Hat and Bruno. Like those are obviously enablers for those for that type of thing. But yeah, I'm curious. It definitely, it's it's funny because obviously we, the Magic players are just we we see Lantern of Insight and it's like we have flashbacks to getting stuck under ensnaring bridge while your opponent makes it so you can't draw any cards that are ever useful for like seven turns until you inevitably concede because you realize you're dead um yeah <laughs> it's it's funny because no one ever thought that card would be good and then suddenly it was just kind of yeah out of just like and... sneakily innocent and then all of a sudden you're just having the least amount of fun you've ever had in the card game. <laughs> yeah. well i mean like you know i i think an effect like this is is kind of unassuming right because yeah. I mean, you know, you guys stay in magic like there's something similar, but like, you know, for me who hasn't lived through it, it's just like, oh, okay. You you get to see the top of your opponent's deck. You just get to see what their next draw is. So it's information you didn't have before, and information is always powerful, no matter what you know, what hidden information you're getting, it's always something that will give you an edge. So 
I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's gonna be fun. I, I I hope we get another couple of cards that synergize with it, just so at the very least we could do something that's kind of thematic yeah. or at least build you more around two. it. <laughs> I would like a couple more. You have the new goblin guide, so you know whether or not you're gonna give them a character. <laughs> um, and then you have I, I, we didn't I mean, I think regardless yet, or not, right? you're always questing with that. <laughs> if that's in your deck, I feel like you're questing every time. Yeah. But go ahead. What else? We haven't talked about Oswald yet, and that's that synergizes true. with it. I forgot. That's a, that's a full of... set away, though. That's true. It is. But it it's kind of like Oswald is like you don't need to know the top card of your deck. You're still going to ink. Yep. Um, well, you might not want to put it on the bottom if you know you're not going to hit. It could be a yeah. good card you want to draw. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's lots of cool cards, like um, you it know, can, Corsair it Crufix like, from Magic, right? Yeah, like yeah, like if you have a a a popsicle already, you were like, oh well, I know I need to draw a card before I ink because I know if I ink, I'm gonna miss. Right. So it it gives you that kind of interaction. Yeah, so information. Like I could, it could be a player in Oswald for sure. Yeah, um, you're like, oh, you play your popsicle first before you ink because you know the top card's not an item. So then you draw, and maybe the top card's an item after that. But I would much <laughs> rather have. Dive. I'd rather have an item that costs like eight. Uh, that says you can look at and play the top card of your deck whenever you want. Like I want future sight. Like that card is fun. Mm -hmm. Definitely a fair card, right? Like I worry in Lorcana where it's easier to get to high ink counts. Oh, it would be so stupid good. <laughs> and work with Oswald, like, boom, yeah. combo. Good game. It's never going to happen, but... I mean, maybe Ursula's Cauldron makes a uh, makes a comeback. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, yeah, the, the Hat and Bruno get to play with it. And, like, I was already testing out Bruno with uh, the tutor, Madrigal, and I know I said that wrong. Uh, and that was, like, not terrible. And not having to use Amber, being able to use Blue to ramp, so you could play turn two, one jump, turn three, Bruno, turn four, play that, start get Like, you could play that and a Bruno, and you just start gaining. And evasive, hard to interact with. Like, that that could be a thing. Like, I know people will build it. Uh, I'm going to build it day one. Uh, I'll probably have... <laughs> sign up for uh, your labyrinth discord because we're gonna have so many fun decks for you to try like day one and probably after like a week tell you which ones are actually good yeah. <laughs> be like, probably uh, none of them it, they're all bad there's like, there's like a set three <laughs> set three like the second day of set three uh rmb had a uh a red steel pirate deck and he was like this is broken this beats everything <laughs> <laughs> Classic RMB. Uh, yeah, I do. I played against that in tournament once. So, I mean, to be fair, later. like a week in, it was, it felt really strong. Uh, and then you know, we just we figured out that other things are stronger. Yeah, I mean, John Silver is a pain if you're trying to deal with it with yes. Rage and Storm. John Silver by himself was like he was the whole reason that RMB wanted to make the deck was because of John Silver. Oh. Every time I see a new location get printed from now, it's like the aerial check. I'm like, oh, this is an Amber Steel like song. I'm putting this bad boy in the deck. Like it's fine in a slot. Like I see a location that's good. I'm like, can John Silver do? Is this it? Is this the missing piece of the puzzle to make John Silver just annoy the crap out of every blue steel player I ever see? This is uh, just kind of touching on that. This is something that RMB and I I think Wonder or I think Bannable was there too when we were talking about it. Um isn't it wild that like the benchmark for locations is arguably one of the best cards in the game being Queen's Castle. And there's not a single location that comes even close to the power level of Queen's Castle. McDuck Manor. It's not close. I I disagree. <laughs> I think it I is think, close. It's just definitely worse. I th I think you it's could argue odd. that Pride clearly Lands, worse, but I think you could argue that Pride Lands has a similar ceiling. Uh, but the average Pride Lands gameplay is 
so much below where the average castle gameplay is but there's the like pride lands is a combo card yeah so like that's what i'm referring to is like it is nice seeing at least another look at a location it's like oh that actually does something but yeah it's like what mcduck manor and then castle I, there's murmurs of fang but i haven't heard anything good about it well, I mean, you know, when you look at the playable locations, right, you have Queen's Castle and McDuck Manor, I think, are, like, I, I think they're the two at the top. Um, and then Pride Lands, Underworld, to a degree, uh, I think Hidden Cove might be, like, above um, above Cove's Pride good. Lands, maybe. But, like, that, but that, that's it. And that's... the rest of them are, like, subpar at best. And I think... Yeah, so while I was in Castle and Enchanted, is what you're getting at. Yeah, that, seriously. Yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I know I'd mentioned this in our discussion too the other day, is just like, it, it's kind of a problematic design space where because they don't fight back at all, they end up being really, really high risk, high, re high reward cards because th the threat of Maui or Hercules or Scar coming down, Fox Mim even, and just like eating it for free sets you so far behind, right? You spend a card and time walk yourself. If, if your opponent gets to develop to the board, lose no cards and just completely eat it before you get any value at all and i think that's that results in the situation where the card has to be so absurdly good when it's good that it, it sort of limits you know which ones you can play like you just can't play mediocre locations because you can't make a high risk play like that for sort of marginal gain tell that to tau man purple well, <laughs> Talman, he's he's over there jamming Agrabahs against people. Yeah, I don't think he's on Agrabah anymore, but uh, one jump Damn. Jim Hawkins in any location <laughs> combo. I mean, that's not bad. No, I mean, if you get big locations backwards. in early, I think there's some value there. But like before before turn five, it's like the mid game locations, though, for sure. I mean, if you can't survive a Maui, you really are time walking yourself sometimes. I think this. This could really be a format that you like the one drop never lands like could be playable like red blue was shifting off of just like not playing anything any character that costs less than four they're just like brawl's good enough yeah Moyen yeah. has no characters less than four in his list so mm -hmm. yeah it's like crazy not yeah. even running the dra the sisu dragon anymore like the three drop one it's like you got crazy. like neverland and the daisy duck you can just kill him before turn four. <laughs> To just like 31 I drops. Daisy Duck yeah. could probably have better accompaniment. Like, might as well just put Lilo over, Lilo over it. Multipass. Uh, All right. Well, I think that's every topic we uh, we had to cover for today. Again, please come say hi to us. Not me, but, you know, the rest of us in, in Dallas. And yeah, we hope to, we hope to talk to you next time.